Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Decenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Anna Riddle. She is a cognitive scientist specialized in rational decision making. She is an active public speaker and science communicator. She was a researcher at the Viennese Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Decision Support. She is also an alumni of the Global Shapers community organized by the World Economic Forum and served as a curator for the Vienna Hub. So, Anna, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good to be here. Okay, so today I would like to try, to try to go through two main topics. There is your historical map of the cognitive sciences, something that we you've been working on, and also rationality. I mean, if in this episode we don't have enough time to get into rationality, perhaps somewhere in the future we can do a second one. So uh, this historical map, uh, tell us a little bit about what it is exactly, what motivated you to create this map, and what are your goals with it? Yeah, um, so uh, the map as an idea emerged during my study program, where I was basically done with all the lectures, but both I and others in our program felt like actually we really just touched the surface because cognitive science is, it's very interdisciplinary. You have to have a lot of background. You have to understand how many things are connected. And the main motivation, the number one main motivation was just, I wanted to learn better, a big picture view of how cognitive science, well, is interrelated between the different fields, what the backgrounds or the most important publications in different fields really are. Um, so I really have the sense of, I, I know what I'm talking about. Right, you get a master's degree, but uh, when you at the same time you feel like I have not actually mastered the field, then uh, you feel this strong uh, divergence between well uh, the, the two positions. So the main goal was just to to learn, and I think a map is especially powerful because it always uh, shows you also the like wide gaps. Right, it's represented. You see actively where you have gaps in your knowledge, and when we look historically, even for global exploration having gaps in maps was like really important because people noticed oh this is where we don't know something yet so we can go there and look for it um so that was one of the main motivations to just learn things for myself but i also had two other goals um the second one was to represent the information also for others because it wasn't just me that felt like this is very difficult um, i also wanted to summarize the information to maybe make it easier for others um, and then the third um, point was just dialogue, because when you talk one on one, like eh, linearly, whenever I say one thing, you could maybe disagree or add something. But once I represent my actual understanding broader, then you can very precisely go in and also give me feedback where we disagree of what is relevant um, or where I was maybe missing something. So the third thing was really this um, affordance for a deeper dialogue about how we view cognitive science. And we look uh, when you look in, in publications, there were actually, um, yeah, I think in 2019, um, there was the paper, what happened to cognitive science uh, and how is the field developing? So there is an active uh, discussion about where the whole field is going. Um, yeah, and also there's two other older representations. Oh, I'm, but I'm not saying my map goes into this realm of importance, but there's two other older representations of cognitive science. One is from the Sloan report. It's the hexagram that connects the different disciplines and how connected they are, um, which has some problems uh, in its representation. And the second one is the circular diagram by Varela. Uh, which um, shows um, the different disciplines and the different paradigms and then how people are um, basically connected or where, where, where are their positions in the different uh, paradigms are and the disciplines. So I guess that one obvious question to ask here is, uh, what is cognitive science exactly? Because it's interesting to understand how or what exactly you, you, you would include in a map like this. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, well, it's not a simple question. We actually had multiple lectures just on what is cognitive science and what is a mind. Um, but a simple answer would be, or usually the typical answer is the cognitivist answer, which means is about brains or minds doing information processing uh, or systems in general processing information. Um, but yeah, there's exactly also the broader science of the mind that looks at in general, like how are minds, brains, and machines similar in what they do. 
Um, and it's very important to say it's not about the brain necessarily, right? So because ex exactly this information processing abstraction is a different one. When we, for example, look at memory, then, okay, I have a shorter memory, I have a long-term memory. This is the information processing structure, but it does not directly map on my brain structure. So it was very mm -hmm. important to have this different level of how is the information processed in, an, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a functional manner. Others say cognitive science is the, the science of, of intelligence. How, how do agents or systems work in the world to reach their own goals? Um, and there's also a framing of cognitive science as applied epistemology, the question how a system acquires or comes to know the world, or what does knowledge in this sense actually mean? And mm -hmm. knowledge and intelligence are, of course, very intertwined as questions. And then we have AI, artificial intelligence, as the science of the artificial trying to build what we know about intelligence with the, the general notion of if you can't build it, then you don't understand it, which mm -hmm. you can also disagree with, but that's that's how different conceptualizations are are connected. So tell us a little, a little bit more about how you went about organizing the map, because I'm looking at it, I mean, I will show it during the video version of this interview on YouTube, but I'm looking at it and you have... Uh, basically, it divided in several decades throughout the 20th century, and then also uh, a column for the 19th century, I guess, mostly. And then you have uh, different theories, different schools of thought, paradigms, I guess, in cognitive science. So how did you go about organizing all of this? And why did you decide on the sort of uh, timeline, let's say? Um. So originally I started out with even asking myself how to structure the information. And this took actually a very long time. So reading diverse resources to at the same time building up my own um, understanding of the field and then finding a way to represent it. This took a very, very long time because you simultaneously change your own understanding and then the thinking of what, what you think is best to, to represent it. Um, I, I had ideas of like circular notions or more like a network, how topics are related, like more like a mind map. Um, and then the, the key insight um, why I chose this one was, A, I think the historical context is often very important, like understanding um, the dialectic, right? So there is a current paradigm that is present. And then what comes afterwards is usually a reaction to what was missed before. Um, so the historical context is really quite powerful and also understanding the, the broader context, right? So for example, uh, how yeah historical events have shaped um, developments. Um, but then secondly, next to, to the historical importance, uh, I saw one other map that really inspired me a lot, which I think is really excellent, uh, which is by Brian Castellani. He created, a, I think him and a colleague, I'm sorry if I missed the person now, but uh, they created a map of the complexity science or sciences and that's really purely excellent. And my my current map is far from uh, as thorough as what they have created there. Um, and I, I I'm currently not working on my map, but I I hope uh, if I if I have time to get back to it, to at one point uh, have it at that level as Brian Castellani's map of the complexity science, which I also really recommend looking at. Mm -hmm. So let's try to walk through some of the timeline here. So it starts actually in the 19th century, correct? That's the point where you start the map. Yeah, um, that's whenever you try to represent knowledge, you have to right, ask yourself, well, what is relevant? Where do I make the cutoff point? And I think the majority that is relevant for today did happen in the last century. And then it's important to have some understanding of what happened before. But mm -hmm. as like, population exploded also, I would say insight in science has definitely exploded in the last century. So this is the most important time to really look at in depth. Uh, but of course, uh, both psychology, which is a part of cognitive science, uh, and cognitive science have works that are relevant for it that go back to to Buddhist literature, to, to Greek philosophers. They have always already thought about the mind, uh, but it's, of course, not as... Right. You, there's always more you can look at. You have to make a cut up, uh, cut-off point, and that's where I, I made mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, there are many things that we could talk about here regarding the 19th century. We have the work of Wundt, for example, and structuralism, pragmatism, psychoanalysis. I mean, but generally speaking, how would you say the 19th century basically set the stage for what happened later throughout the 20th century and now in the early 21st 
century? Uh, I, I mean, there was there was a lot happening um, in uh, those cent like in in the century. So it's difficult to um, to summarize what the main thing was. But I would just say there was absolutely already really excellent work done by scientists. And um, I, I think sometimes it's easy to have this arrogance of older things are to be neglected and to be dismissed uh, because now we know everything better. But I, I think the more you take it seriously and actually go back to psychophysics or psychometrics, um, the, the, the more you understand that given the means Technically, they had, they really did fantastic work um, with, with a lot of precision, uh, measuring things like a very good empirical work that I, I would absolutely try to understand before I, uh, before I think we've already figured uh, everything out today. And even now, when you, when you think of like active inference, Carl Friston's work, right, th th those were ideas that are, not, of course, now formalized, but people like Helmholtz, they already understood the the main ideas, or um, at least considered them, and and just uh, worked on them in a in a less less technically or mathematically advanced way. Mm -hmm. And so then we get, and I'm just going to highlight a few things that happen that happen here throughout the decades. Of course, we don't have enough time to explore it in detail, but then we get into the 1930s. So uh, two questions there. Uh, I mean. Uh, the 19, uh, during the first three decades of the 20th century, I mean, basically, I'm asking you why we go from uh, that er er later period of the 19th century up to the 1930s. I mean, am, am I missing something about the three previous decades, the first three decades of the 20th century here? Or why, why, is, why is there that uh, yes. gap, at least as far as I'm uh, noticing it. So everything before I've really compressed down as much as possible, to just basically make notes that it existed. Um, but I chose the 1930s because one of the biggest shifts of cognitive science as we understand it now was the cognitive revolution uh, mm -hmm. historically. And yeah. to understand the cognitive revolution, you have to understand the one thing that came before it, which was the reaction to, which is that of behaviorism. Uh, yeah. And this is what I, I wanted to start out with because Cognitive science, um, cognitivism, uh, those ideas uh, were very like a very strong reaction to the idea of behaviorism. Uh, for, for context, like behaviorism basically understands uh, the mind as a black box. It says we can understand inputs and then outputs. Uh, it, um, ideas like reinforcement learning, right? Like oh, a, a reward signal and then a, an animal doing more of a certain behavior. Things like that came out of behaviorism, uh, but they uh, understood the mind as a complete black box. Um, and then we had multiple yeah, conceptual shifts that basically welcomed uh, cognitive science or cognitivism to the stage. And I think uh, two of the main publications or ideas or people were, uh, I think, Tolman with uh, cognitive maps, I think, showing in rats that they must have ideas or like they, they must do something in their brain and we're, or, or in their mind and we're not completely agnostic about it. We know something about it. Um, so that was extremely important. And then uh, the second uh, point is uh, the, the idea by, by Skinner of verbal behavior, trying to understand language from a behaviorist perspective, and then Jomsky uh, introducing uh, uh, ideas of, of, yeah, of grammar uh, and, and uh, syntax uh, to, to really show, no, no, we, we, do, we do know something here. There is something going on and we can make progress in understanding it. And then we, you had this big Kuhnian paradigm shift from from uh, behaviorism to cognitive science or, or cognitivism, uh, mm -hmm. the cognitive revolution. And then I think people would date current cognitive science historically to 1956 as like the, the year um, cognitive science was like kind of birthed. There were many things that happened during the time like uh, uh, George Miller's The Magical Number Seven, um, uh, like understanding channel capacities and things like that. Then Chomsky's, uh, uh, verbal behavior or mm -hmm. like syntax sorry syntactical structures uh like directly afterward broadband's perception communication uh McCulloch and Pitts so a lot was happening at the same time there and then the other second date that you could use as a, like an introduction like a or a, a foundation date for cognitive science would maybe be 19 uh, sorry 1978 the, the Sloan report where they officially like 
said like we are founding this this program on cognitive science. So there's multiple dates you could use. It depends on what you what you want to do with it. Yeah. So but mm -hmm. for for context, but you, your question was why I made the cutoff as uh, at like 1930 or started there because yeah. you need to understand behaviorism to understand the cognitive revolution. Mm -hmm. And so you've already mentioned a few things that happened up to the 1970s and uh, I mean, the, uh, about the 1960s, 70s and perhaps a little bit the 80s as well, there are at least two things that I would like to highlight here and ask you about one of them, because later on talking about rationality, it makes perfect sense to mention it and then there's another thing. So. Kahneman and Tversky, right? And uh, I mean, what what was basically the role, the main role that they played here in basically this history of cognitive science? Um, so that's a big jump, I feel like, now in history. <laughs> I think I would like prefer actually to stay mm -hmm. back in, in history a bit because that's, I think... Can we maybe talk about this more in in the in the rationality part? Because I feel like mm -hmm. okay, I would just carve out. I, I think they're extremely important. That's why I mm -hmm. work on, on traditional state treat. But I think in the bigger picture of just co uh, cognitive science, they they would not be among the top names that I would personally okay. mention. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, perhaps to introduce another sort of. A paradigm that I think is, if I'm seeing it correctly, it's from the nineteen the 1970s is um, autopoiesis and the embodied mind. Okay, so th this idea that, that I think that later on down the line led to the paradigm of for ease, uh, for e-cognition. T tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I mean, th does it differ significantly from the other paradigms we've already briefly mentioned here what does it does it introduce to cognitive science okay so you asked multiple questions now about like autopoiesis and for e-cognition and what that adds so again to to understand what it adds you have to first go back a bit to understand what mm -hmm. was done before Mm -hmm. And there we can zoom in more in the like the the lower level here in the map where where mm -hmm. you, you look at artificial intelligence, yeah. uh, the foundational ideas there, uh, where you had this um, symbolicist logicist framework of um, thinking of of the mind as or yeah cognition using symbols uh, and then uh, transforming them and and working with representations uh, through symbols um, to make yeah decisions in the world and to act in the world. Uh, which uh, I, in general, I don't think any paradigm is wrong. It is just mm -hmm. useful for different things. And of course, mm -hmm. for use for building artifacts like computers, this paradigm is very valid and absolutely necessary. Uh, but it also um, ignored and abstracted from multiple things that are, uh, of course, relevant or, or uh, important about cognitive systems like a human or yeah, uh, collective collectives maybe even like uh, um, like societies. Uh, but when we, when we look at humans or also animals, um, then if you imagine they would use symbols like abstracted away representations to reason, um, which for example we use in language, right? Language is mm -hmm. symbolic. Um, then you have the question of where where the meaning comes from. Uh, so you have questions of grounded cognition. And then you have, for example, arguments uh, by, um, like, for example, you can read the book Metaphors We Live By, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, many of the ideas or the things we, we say, they are very much grounded in our bodily experience, right? When I say, right. oh, that was uplifting, then what I refer to is my bodily experience that when I'm in a good mood, I'm also more upright, um uh, or or that was exactly that was a downer <laughs> I, I when i when i'm in a bad mood i know that my body will um yeah just shrink together and but but this information is usually when you completely abstract from things away it, it, the language does not reveal where those um like the, the purely symbolic uh, part of the language does not reveal where this this um yeah the meaning of the sentence comes in and the meaning comes in from my my feeling of being in my body uh, being embodied in in my environment um so questions like those arose um and then autopoiesis um further showed that um 
uh, also humans or, or animals or living beings in general behave very differently from a machine in many ways. In many ways, uh, one is that the, the inherent main goal is self-maintenance, uh, mm -hmm. but also self-organization, uh, also cognitively, which means I, I, I'm uh, engaging in ongoing meaning making uh, of constructing the world so that I can act in it, like creating a world of significant significance. And then mm -hmm. because you said for E, um, of course, further uh, further east than uh, embodied, uh, there's a general the em embedded and active or enacted or extended uh, mm -hmm. showing uh, both like uh, I'm not in a in an abstract way environment that I engage with in a in a re symbolic representation, but I'm actually in the environment and that comes with certain difficulties and how to reason about it. Uh, but then also an in, in active, uh, a lot of cognition has more to do for exactly for acting in the world, like for motor output, uh, than for just like reasoning, because we, we think for action, right? The cognition has a certain function. Uh, it's not about just finding the truth, but it's about doing the right thing in an ongoing embedded environment. Um, and then extended um, cognition also shows problems like um, confusing the brain or the body with the like the, the, the boundary of cognition because when I for example use my smartphone then by now this is of course part of my cognition that will uh, um, yeah moderate um, my my engagement with information with the environment if it was direct part of my brain we would say oh this is definitely part of my mind uh, if part of me engaging with my environment is being in regular communication with a certain person that helps me to make sense of the world, then they are also more part of my cognition. Mm -hmm. uh, it just shows the problem of setting a real, like, close boundary um, around just the physical body, just because that seems to be the the obvious boundary, but but conceptually, it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the 1990s, we've already gotten here a little bit into for e-cognition and the idea of the extended mind specifically. Uh, what about the decade of the brain here, as you have it at the top with George W. Bush mentioned? So uh, <laughs> why is it called the uh, decade of the brain exactly? Um, so uh, uh, during that time, there was a lot of, uh, like especially much funding going into neuroscience, uh, as mm -hmm. I currently understand. That's my current understanding of it. And okay. I used the decade of the brain to uh, to represent a there was a lot of research going on which is not all represented here so you have to actually google decade of the brain to see what what lies behind it because a lot was done in the name but it also shows mm -hmm. uh, that because it got so much funding that there was a very vivid awareness of the importance of understanding the brain um and i think the thir third thing it also shows is that how often um um a certain like trend or importance of research is not just coming out of conceptual or like new new ideas necessarily, but also new mm -hmm. technology. And for for the decade of the brain, um, the 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 game changer there was that uh, uh, techniques like uh, MR, MRI, fMRI uh, got way better. So there was just a lot of, of research to be done with the new technologies, and they uh, sparked the this very uh, active period period in research. Mm -hmm. And so getting into the 20th century in the 2000s, there are perhaps two or three things here that I would like to highlight. So one of them is cultural cognition with Michael Tomasello and then the free energy principle. So particularly when it comes to culture, what does it add to the picture here? Um, so, um, Tomasello talks a lot about ideas like shared intentionality and mm -hmm. how culture helps groups succeed together. He also talks about many other things, but I think it's a, the main point is that precisely what I said with extended cognition, it also shows that we don't just act as individuals, we do act as groups. And we can make progress in understanding how that works. Um, and uh, Tomasello is a, is a very good example of that, uh, uh, reading his research there. Um, yeah, and then Carl Fristen, uh, the free energy principle, predictive coding, uh, active inference uh, was one of the yeah major advancements in the 
the last two decades um, that really unif like it's a very unified framework of many things that we had before talking about rationality and optimality, which we hopefully will do later. Um, mm -hmm. I think Friston really brought many ideas together, going from physics to artificial intelligence, uh, the current frameworks, trying to really bring them together with, with, this, with this idea um, of free energy. Mm -hmm. And then just before we get into what cognitive science, science basically looks like today, in the 2010s, we have also the Human Brain Project. So why is that so important in this decade, particularly? Um, yeah, to be honest, now, in retrospect, I would probably make it smaller. Um, I would change a lot in the in the math by now. Uh, this, I mean, this is already like now a couple of years old. Mm -hmm. Thought and there's many things wrong or not mm -hmm. as relevant as I thought. It was an ongoing process. So I would yeah. probably bring the human brain project as far as I understood, this was not so not as successful as it tried to be uh, and a bit uh, over oversold. Um, but also also I just don't know in detail what came out of it, other than uh, I think the main main goals, as far as I understand, were not reached. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I want to say so um given how much uh, work, uh, like like research work in general has just increased. What is of course massively wrong about my map is this huge gaps in the last two decades, because we probably did have right, the best work in the most recent times. And there should basically be no gap. There should be way more in there. Uh, and I just uh, haven't done that yet. But also it is of course way easier to decide what the most important things were once a bit of time has passed to sh to reveal what was actually the most important. So there's just so much actually going on that it's really difficult to choose. Uh, but also there's, of course, many things that I um, I did not uh, represent that I already know are important. But I, I think uh, the very important things uh, are, are for sure the, the achievements in artificial intelligence that are not mentioned well at all. I did me I mentioned like the old thing of like deep blue winning against Kasparov in 1997 but then also the new uh, goals there of like AlphaGo wins against uh, Lee Sedol mm -hmm. uh, and AlphaGo zero uh, like in 2016-2017 but then I mean it just continues I mean right now uh, there were uh, just when you look at 2023 uh, with chat GPT there like so many like large language models so many things are happening um uh and this is like a, a minor side project in a sense right so um I'm not really uh, on the ball to continuously evaluate and add things to it. Um, I hope, I mean, one of the main um, dynamics of the internet is, of course, you can put something on the internet and then someone will scream at you where you're wrong. Uh, so I still hope that some people will like look at it and be extremely offended by it to then tell me uh, what were the main things that you're missing. So they, you know, like help me <laughs> to actually uh, uh, fill the gaps here. So please, uh, if someone sees this and, and they have strong opinions, please scream at me where I'm wrong feel terribly offended that that was one of the main goals because I think this is exactly the dialogue and the power of the internet where you where you can learn <laughs> right so I have one or two more questions just about the map before we move on to rationality so uh, I was just looking here at some of the main I guess you would call it paradigms across the map like behaviorism symbolic logistic cognitivism rational analysis and connectionism and also the four is of cognition here so how, how do you look at how they relate to one another because i'm seeing here particularly that some of them ob overlap a little bit or at least occur over the course of several different decades and involve several different of course researchers and schools of thought so uh, how do you look at their relationship relationship if there's any there and why these particular big paradigms? Um, again, I would probably do it differently right now. I think it's not like because the bubbles, right? That the blobs, mm -hmm. they don't actually uh, represent what should be in them. So mm -hmm. now I would probably more like color the bubbles, like the, the actual like rep uh, publications in different colors or so. Yeah. There was just no, like it was, design choice is very difficult. Uh, I tried my best, but it was like in retrospect, not not ideal. I tried with the with the shapes roughly show their size over time, right? How they mm -hmm. developed, 
again, I would disagree by now with, with certain shapes and, and the choice, um, but just to, to show the general emergence of different paradigms, um, like first, what is like, I, I hope people here know what a paradigm is, but a paradigm is uh, a certain like framework for what you even, how you abstract for things and what kind of questions mm -hmm. you ask. And then you have Cunha and conceptual changes between them where, where uh, just science starts to ask new kind of questions that foreground some other things and uh, uh, ignores other parts. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the ones I, I chose, I think like behaviorism, exactly, it's it's, it's still important to study um, systems like that, uh, but it was relevant to understand how cognitivism emerged as an answer uh, historically to behaviorism, even though older world uh, work, like like mentioned, like wound or, or psychophysics, it's also in a sense uh, cognitivism. It was just not as, as, it's not as represented in like recent history, but of course there was cognitivism also before, I would say. Um, Yes, uh, so cognitivism is still extremely uh, strong and also powerful and important. Um, and then in the, the more in the computer science uh, part, you have the, the symbolicist, logicist um, paradigm, exactly like working with with uh, yeah propositions, symbols, um, and so forth. Um, then the connectionism is the whole idea of neural networks and and how they um, learn uh, certain yeah certain uh, relations between input and output. Um, and yeah, the 4E of cognition then came as a as an answer or like a movement against the cognitivism paradigm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm really not sure whether rational analysis should be here or whether I just put it in because I care so much about it. But uh, I, I, I probably think, uh, yeah, it's a difficult decision. Um, I hope people disagree with me and say how they would do it. Um, mm -hmm. I would probably remove it by now to just make it more clean and keep the main um paradigms uh more more present relatively to it um yeah um don't know what else to say here yeah uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> no that that's okay and, and i mean the, the the way the main reason why i really wanted to ask you about this map is because i really think that it is a great summary at least of the main things that the main events in the development of cognitive science and I guess it's an ongoing work and other people might have different inputs so at least it's good food for thought to have a basically an overview of cognitive science over the years and decades so ju just one last question and then this is more curiosity on my side so you end the map, of course, in the current 2020s. Do you have any idea about what cognitive science might look like in the future? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you can always go the, the naive empirical way and just uh, predict from what we've seen already and Im imagine the trends will continue. So I, I think a lot of advancements in AI uh, will continue to happen. And they will reveal um, also many things about cognition in general. So this is going to mm -hmm. happen for sure. Um, but then also on the fringes, there are many connections um, that are still to be made. And I, I see a lot of space to actually create lots of new information, like even like with anthropology, um, understanding how humans who are quite intelligent use different artifacts or ritual to make sense together, um, to to like right, like create technology to master the environment. Um, I don't know whether you can still master the environment, but uh, to uh, to reach the goals in an environment and uh, and so forth. So uh, there's so much space in, in in economics where we understand markets as collective uh, information processing systems. There's a lot of space to bring in more cognitive science. Um, yeah, I, I think there's so rich literature. Uh, historically and presently, there's there's so much to draw from. Like I, I I don't see it ever ever get getting, yeah, just like ever being just done. Uh, there, there, it might feel like it sometimes. Um, like oh, okay, now everything's happening in, in AI. But I think we can always basically agree that we are relatively quite ignorant about the world, and there's just so much more out there. And really, in every in every domain, from psychology, where I think the replication crisis really revealed a lot of conceptual problems or method methodological problems where I think cognitive modeling is now uh, taking more up more space that that's fantastic um yeah but there 
so much to be done. There's good philosophy to to have, good theories to found to yeah, actually, especially have this interdisciplinary dialogue where you actually take very very like conceptually far apart things and actually bring them together and create this this space of understanding between disciplines. There's, I'm very confident that, that it's not gonna dry out anytime soon. Sure. So let's get into rationality then, which is a big part of your own work. So first of all, what is the great rationality debate? Yes. Okay. Let's first like maybe start with what rationality is and why it matters. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I, I always take it for self-evident. So <laughs> I often forget saying it, but it, but one should say it. Um, so rationality is um the idea of basically how to reach your goals in the environment, right? How how to make decisions or the judgment and decisions to do the right thing, basically. There's this book by Stuart Russell uh, about do the right doing the right thing, uh, studies in limited rationality. Um, but um, and of course, we, we care about getting what we want. We care about reaching our goals. And because we inherently think what we want uh, or what, what what is good is good. That's why rationality is important, because more of it is accordingly also good. Um, and rationality is also the term that basically represents intelligence. So rationality is a technical term in AI to mean uh, optimal decision making. So originally, Artificial intelligence was discussed to be called computational rationality, but to include, uh, I think, Norbert Wiener's approach uh, that was not computational, they chose artificial intelligence. So I'm not talking about rationalism, I'm talking about rationality. Okay, as this is a very <laughs> difficult question uh, that is answered by many different fields, uh, there has been ongoing debates, but the rationality debate I am focusing on right now is specifically between, I think, mostly economics and other fields. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, economics had this paradigm or this way of understanding humans as homo economicus, as being perfectly rational uh, and taking that as self-evident uh, and, and just a pure fact. And then you had counter reactions to that by, for example, Kahneman and Tversky, who founded on behavioral econ economics to show that humans do uh, diverge from optimal thinking in many ways. Um, so that was one of the, the, the first uh, counter movements to just show, uh, no, this is not a self-evident truth. Uh, there is some, some difference there. Uh, and then you had multiple ongoing debates between, right? Like, so you had the, the Panglossians that think, okay, humans are as good as it gets given the constraints. Then you had the meliorists like uh, Kahneman and, and, uh, and Tversky and, and uh, Stanovich and others. Let's say there is a very clear difference between optimal decision making and human decision making, and one could potentially also close it. Then you had more Panglossians coming in, basically agreeing with the more economics and, and neoclassical notion, like for example, Gigerenzer, that show, oh no, actually, given all the constraints, uh, humans are um, are very very rational already, um, and that the main difference here always was that we looked at what right, we had normative ideals and we had theories or like empirical fact about humans and that different sides came to this gap and argued about it in different ways so the the meliorist, meliorist says oh there's a, there's a gap between rationality and humans and the pangolosians said no actually our normative models are wrong and don't take into consideration many of the uh many of the the constraints we actually operate under um, and then the new rationality debate that's that's I think currently taking place is no longer about the gap, like how rational are humans, which was very important also for many economic uh, many, many assumptions in economics, like mm -hmm. equilibria and so forth. But the current debate is more about what even is the rationality question and really very deep conceptual um, assumptions in in the in in this uh, in in the whole like in the whole framework. Like what? How even do we ask the rationality question in a sense? Okay, so let's break that down a little bit. And before I get into the biases and heuristics part, I mean, basically the work by Kahneman and Tversky and some comments on it, uh, you mentioned there that, of course, people are right now trying still to understand conceptually what rationality really is. So when tackling rationality, what would you say are perhaps some of the questions about human cognition that we want answer exactly um so i think historically uh one of the most important advancement there uh, advancements there uh, was exactly the work by kahneman and tversky which mm. was absolutely crucial here um and they showed how 
in this in this framework of how it was asked um when we make more complex inferences about the world usually we have to have heuristics to shortcut the actual computation um and those heuristics uh, because they're simpler rules, um, they, of course, uh, are adapted to certain environments, but not to others. So they can lead to system systematic errors. So I think that was one of the main uh, understandings that still apply. And uh, it really tells you a lot about how humans think and, and what errors they, they will make. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to biases and heuristics, I mean, we tend to call them errors, right? But are, are they, do, do you think that that should be uh, the correct way of talking about them or perhaps more mental shortcuts? Because it not it the case that, at least as far as I understand it, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Uh, but as far as I understand it, isn't it the case that most of the time they still operate well? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is two different ways how you can look at it. Um, in the, the meliorist axiomatic approach, you would talk about it as like errors. Mm -hmm. um, Right, like a bias is, or, or sorry, no, no, sorry, it's not an, an error. A, a bias is a systematic uh, way of, of thinking, and it mm -hmm. can lead to errors uh, in 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 exactly in systematic ways. Uh, yes, but uh, exactly. So currently, we have the the resource rationality idea by uh, Griffith and Leader uh, that look at okay, given the actual the actual computational capacities uh, of, for example, humans. Uh, in specific situations, what is actually the best they can do given like, because we only have bounded optimality. There is of course certain things we can never do. We're not omniscient. So there is a maximum we can do. And given the, the, the resource rationality, we, we then can examine a specific so-called biases and determine whether they um, whether they are boundedly optimal. Uh, and they also bring forth the point that, that this is indeed the case that often, for example, framing effects are indeed uh, boundedly rational, given all the constraints uh, on on multiple levels that we're under, and yes, also even the notion of a bias um, has a strong connotation of exactly error. Uh, but of course, we need biases in our decision making to make any decision, um, we, we, because we we just we just currently discussed uh, or was discussed the last year. We are not having this view from nowhere where we have this objective processing of everything. So we need biases uh, to actually uh, come to any conclusion or, or just do anything. Like with, uh, that's basically, you have to make a judgment, right? So you also need biases and that's also where your priors come in to a degree. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to understanding rationality, it's very important to take into account the goals of particular individuals, right? I mean, that matters a lot because if I understand it correctly, rationality is a lot about having a certain set of goals set up and then being able to follow through to achieve to achieve them, right? And that, that, that's the main idea. You're not about mostly having perhaps an idealized goal that would be the most rational sort of, sort of action that anyone would take or the most rational goal that anyone would have and try to achieve it. Exactly. So uh, rationality does not claim some absolute knowledge of what one should do, mm -hmm. uh, independently of who, who one is, but it it, it is a, a abstracted uh, idea that says, yes, it's about decision making relative to your knowledge at a given mm -hmm. point in time, uh, and also the goals that you have. So, uh, of course, so it's more about the process of what to do, or, or yeah, or how to to process information to do the right thing, given your goals and what you know, yes. And in this particular case, ecology or the ecological conditions people live in would also be very important, right? Because, I mean, perhaps what would be rational behavior in a particular ecology would not be rational in another kind of ecology. And so we also have to look at the, let's say, broader environment. Yes, exactly. So um, the whole ecological rationality framework, where where I think the, the most important names to mention are uh, Gerd Gigerenter and Ralph Hertwig, uh, who ha I think both have been on your show, or at least uh, uh, Ralph Hertwig has been on your show. Um, so uh, they are uh, the, the the people to to look uh, towards to to understand this. And one of the things this ecological rationality tries to do is to find good simple rules that are uh, correct or lead to success given certain environments. 
Um, and then another person that's not like not as directly in the space uh, that also talks about this is Mirta Galesic. Uh, she she talks about uh, how, of course, what is rational also really depends to your social relative to your social context, which usually always determines your survival and thriving in the world. So it, it, finding the absolute truth about the world uh, and what to do uh, can is not always rational, right? Because I uh, I I might be ostracized for it. Um, so it's also about adapt ad adapting to to the actual environment. Yes. And so uh, there are two big conflicts here when trying to understand rationality, how it works, what constitutes rational or irrational behavior. It is on the one hand efficiency, robustness, and on the other hand speed, accuracy. Right? Could you explain that? Yes. Okay. So in the whole um, in so there's this notion of computational rationality uh, by. Uh, Gershman and 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 uh, colleagues, uh, mm -hmm. and it explains this idea that um, you have to make the best decisions in an in in a situation, uh, and that has multiple constraints. Uh, so one constraint is of course um, my own ability of like how much pro information I can process, but then I also have opportunity costs of like expected value of my action coming from the embeddedness in the environment. Yeah. So. For example, when I am in an ongoing situation where a person is bleeding next to me, every second that I'm thinking about what I should be doing about it, the person is more likely to die. So the apt optimal choice cannot be uh, me sitting around for an hour to contemplate it, but uh, it is relative to um, the speed of acting in the world. So there is a trade-off of accuracy and processing all the information I have versus actually acting because there's real life opportunity costs to uh, to overthinking basically uh, and this is uh, something that exactly they argue quite well in in their paper on uh, uh, computational rationality from 2015 um yeah. so this is about the speed accuracy trade off um the the um the trade off that the more ecological rationality side of of things uh, emphasizes is the idea of efficiency uh, and robustness uh, which which uh, says that often Given uncertainty conditions, often simpler rules are more robust to environmental conditions. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, bas yeah. Basically, the, the question of how do I cut through the through the uncertainty of knowing how the actual um, yeah environment is going to to behave. Um, yeah, I think names here are um, uh, Henry Brighton is very important. The main point they made is uh, to uh, I think Brighton and Gigerens to 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 show that. Um, uh, there is a certain bias bias in the literature um and it, of course bias is not the only source source of error the other so source of error is uh, the variance um and yeah th that's exactly why robustness to to uh, the actual conditions is is also extremely important and i guess that this leads us to another very important important idea here that is there are instances and now i'm thinking more about kahneman's idea of uh, system one and system two in cognition, in human cognition, there are instances where taking longer to think and to make a decision will not make you necessarily more accurate. Right. Yes. 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 Uh, in in the in the examples that are typically used in the axiom, so so axiomatic rationality uh, admits that it's basically very dif very difficult to to determine whether someone was actually maximizing expected utility in a complex uh, environment and to shortcut that th they used um the axiomatic formalization which means if i reason in accordance to the laws of probability and to the axioms of rationality then i behave as if i i am rational or as if i'm behaving rational and then they went on to show that people often do violate those rules um like of, of probability theory and then course the claim is that if my beliefs are not uh correctly um uh how, how do you say it um uh weighted then then i will also make more wrong judgment and not maximize my utility um yes but in those examples that are very formalized usually longer reasoning uh will lead to better examples as uh, or to better outcomes um typically it's like the cognitive reflection task 
uh, with like the bed in the ball or the water lilies. Uh, I hope I hope you know all of those. Uh, and then uh, the idea that you always have a first wrong response. That's like the, the automatic system one response. Then you have to not only notice that this is wrong, but you have to also inhibit yourself. You have to not say it, right? You're not blurting out the wrong thing, but like, huh, noticing that this is not right and then do the actual calculation uh, which also means some certain uh, some some cultural knowledge that has to be given because if you don't know how to actually do certain kinds of mathematics, then you will not be able to. So you need the the actual software as a standard which describes it. Uh, do the calculation and come to the right response. And in those examples, longer thinking is always better. Uh, but in real life, uh, this is of course uh, not not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. And another very important aspect here has to do with uncertainty. So what is uncertainty exactly and what role does it play in this rationality debate? Yes, so uh, uncertainty is often described as as risk. I, I do not know how the how the environment will actually unfold. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, in in economics, you usually treat uncertainty as quantifiable and you describe it as risk, which means you have a certain probability for certain states of the world. And then you can calculate which actions given which state make the most sense uh, or will bring the, the most gains, which is in, in small world abstractions like uh, like poker or or maybe also maybe also chess. Uh, this, this this can be done. Uh, the probability theory is extremely potent there, and you should definitely know it and also apply it. Um, but outside of um, of uh, of those those abstractions, um, uh, uncertainty is usually not quantifiable. We do not. There's a lot we do not know. Uh, we can not put a number on certain events happening or not. But given this very limited knowledge about the future, where all my future actions and goals are laying, uh, is of course uh, the main problem of how to act given uh, that I do not know uh, what the states of, of the world will be and what the consequences of my actions will be. So I would like to get now into something you wrote recently about together with John Verveke, that is relevance realization. So what is that and how does it come into this picture of the rationality debate? Um, so... Relevance as a uh, relevance realization um, as a as an idea shows that many notions in rationality have the same problem as as fitness uh, because in right in, in in evolution fitness is good but you cannot have a theory of fitness because fitness is realized by multiple processes interplaying with one another um, and they, right it's never you can never say to be strong is Good is fitness because sometimes uh, weaker creatures, for example, survived uh, because they were not killed by a meteor or whatever. Um, so uh, fitness is something that uh, comes through the process of multiple things uh, interacting and, and exactly an emergent process. And similarly, what is correct to do and also what to attend to in the environment has to be a process um, where you that is always ongoing between a current abstraction or like focus of what I'm doing, but simultaneously paying uh, paying attention to the con uh, context uh, and and be like like have a kind of a penetrable notion uh, of of current importance to ongoingly create what the next thing to do really is. Mm -hmm. So I, I I like to give the example of uh, let's imagine I again I'm I'm a chess player or a poker player. I'm sitting on the table. Um, in in the in the framework of the game, um, I can win quite well if I'm if I'm if I'm let's say a trained poker player or chess player. Uh, yeah. But then maybe I see someone someone flinch or like like just like do a weird movement and suddenly I notice oh the whole thing was set up to actually like abduct me or something right. So uh, of course I'm making it up, but to show that I cannot just like focus on one part of the world and then optimally win that, but I have to have this ongoing awareness um, of of what is going on um and uh, to to create what is relevant to do to have this optimal grip on reality um and uh in in axiomatic rationality you, you assume a preformed formalization of the environment in which i can do the optimal thing which is not the case in in the open-ended uh radically uncertain world we're actually in 
Uh, and in ecological rationality, uh, there is the notion of given a certain environment, uh, there is specific things you can do. Uh, but uh, of course, there is no, th that's the, the point that Varela also makes, there is no, the environment is, is enacted. Uh, what about the uh, environment is relevant to my goals is a continuous uh, creating of a world of significance to me, and it's not an external thing. So psychophysical notions of an of like the correct cue uh, in the environment to show me what to do about it does not hold. I have to ongoingly bring that forth, as as it says in the literature, um, to to learn uh, what to pay attention to. Um, yes. And, and so in this particular case, just to make it clear, you're taking also some insights uh, from uh, embodied cognition. I'm not sure if for e-cognition more broadly and perhaps dynamic systems, the theory or not. Yes, I think the most important point or or idea from, from like paradigmatic views in cognitive science here is an activism, um, mm -hmm. which is the, the middle path between uh, idealism and realism. Yes. Uh, it's basically the idea of creating this interface of, of perception as well that Donald Hoffman is talking about, um, where I I don't see things as uh, they are, but I, I think I, I, I observe things as how they relate to me. Uh, and, similar, uh, and exactly in that way, in, in many situations, I will have to create uh, the meaning of, of an object and environment to, relative to my goals and also make many inferences of, of what that entails. And it's an ongoing process. So the, the process perspective is extremely relevant. Um, but uh, yeah, I, but underlying, uh, I think this is very close to the predictive processing uh, ideas uh, and, and uh, is not, yeah, not too far away from all of that. You know what, I might be completely missing the point here, but when you mentioned there are things like fitness and now how we basically do not really relate to some sort of objective reality out there, but to a sort of constructed reality, it reminds me very much of some of the arguments made by Donald Hoffman. I'm not sure if that makes sense or not. No, I just, I, exactly, I just mentioned him, right? Exactly, that's exactly this idea of creating an interface and, and how, how things relate and in the current like rationality debate, that's the uh, uh, people like Ted Bufelin uh, talk exactly about perception and 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 the very much the importance. And given also older literature like naturalistic decision making, uh, we really see that how we perceive the world is very much related to our goals that we know from mm -hmm. all the research about attention, uh, but then also to relative to our knowledge and our expertise. Um, so what I observe as relevant also changes very critically during the lifespan. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of it is, of course, also embodied. Um, but but uh, first of all, bringing the the first person perspective back in um, was was a very important move. Uh, um, that, that again relates a lot to active inference. Um, and yes, it's a lot about the idea of insight. Um, uh, we talk about uh, that exactly under radical uncertainty. There's exactly this idea that you have to find a way to at any given moment abstract from the world or like uh, formalize a small world model in which you then can uh, uh, um, how, how do you call it? like um, uh, God, think leap versus like right, like uh, um, crossing the bridge when you come to it. And all of those ideas are like, the more you read historically, <laughs> the more you know that people have said this all over again. This idea is not fundamentally new. People like Savage, the founders of decision, uh, Bayesian decision, decision theory already said that, right? Like ideas like Bayesian epistemology, Bayesian decision theory, they only apply in small worlds, but exactly this abstraction of a model of the world um, that is, that's the hard part, right? Like in, when I'm sitting down to a poker game, I can abstract from it and then I can make very good decisions inside this abstraction, but it's this ongoing, uh, yeah, relevance realization of, of what, what to do, what to do next. Uh, that is very dynamic, um, between multiple ways of, of seeing the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to ask, you now, what do you, how do you look at rationality exactly? I mean, is it mostly an individual phenomenon? Or do you also consider it a social phenomenon? And, and I was thinking here about ideas like, for example, the argumentative theory of reasoning by Dan Sperber and Hugo Mercier, which seems to make a case for it being more the result of a social collective 
process than exactly something that operates just within a particular individual. Yeah. Um, rationality does many things depending mm -hmm. on the context and your goals. Okay. So in general, it's it's a normative notion of how something has to work uh, to, well, to function. Um, and that is extremely powerful because having those ideas can help you to move closer to those ideas, especially in, in artificial intelligence. We need the idea of optimality um, to create intelligent systems. Um, and as an abstraction or as an idea, how true it is, again, is also relative to context. Because, for example, humans we treat as homogenous. We assume, oh, they are all a certain level of rational um, in the literature, but of course you can make very strong st statements that people are very, very different uh, and also rational to various de degrees. Um, so whether you treat it as a, oh, humans are a certain way uh, or, or not, like right, the, the concept does many things depending on the, uh, on, on the context you use it in. And I think you can very much also um, make statements about how rational a collective system is. Um, I, I think that most of the advancements of humanity are certainly uh, grounded in our like collective intelligence and not necessarily the individual. Uh, also, a lot of our knowledge is usually uh, extended or completely embodied by others. Uh, I do not know how to do most things that I that benefit from on a daily basis. Uh, they're completely done by other people. So there's a lot to be said about collective uh, rationality. Um, and also, we know a lot about how collective rationality fails, um, right? There's ideas like, yeah, I, I don't know, the, the the myth of the rational voter and so forth. So even for governance systems, contemplating the idea uh, is, is a very important. A very important. Um, so there's, there's, again, a broad array of things you can do with the concept um, and limitations you have to understand for the ideas to be to be important. But yeah, it's it's relevant for, for different things. Mm -hmm. And, and so this way of reframing rationality through relevance realization, do you think it could have daily life applications and not just be, let's say, a sort of intellectual endeavor? Mm -hmm. I think as a as a researcher, you always operate under the idea that better ideas will also lead to better outcomes. So whatever yeah. is truer. Uh, will also um yeah uh, result like yeah be better in general for for daily life um and for daily life i mean it cer it, it certainly does help to understand where so we need small world idealizations we need probability theory given certain environments if you want to do finance you have to understand probability theory um you have to have certain software to participate in in this uh in this in the market or in in certain games uh or in certain parts of modernity so their axiomatic rationality is completely necessary and all the the way ways it abstracts is, is absolutely crucial same as in economics right uh to to abstract uh or to to, to model things that are attractable you have to have axioms because otherwise it gets intractable so this has a place similarly i do think ecological rationality was extremely and is extremely important and definitely an advancement relative to what we had before. And uh, I, I, by no means would I want to say, oh, right, like we now have the, the real thing that is important and the other mm -hmm. things are not important, but it's definitely perspectival. Um, but relevance realization shows uh, shows certain, I think, pitfalls if you take the others the other ideas to to it. Uh, for for true for like if you just take them too seriously and do not understand the limitations and it explains the dynamical shifting between um yeah formalizations of small worlds versus like an environmental embeddedness um so yes and so, so, sorry and one I, that that's not research that was done by me but um uh, first of all, I would re recommend to read the original work by uh, that that we now heavily built on by John Rebecki and uh, Blake Richards and uh, Timothy Lillycrab from 2012, which was the original uh, relevance realization paper. Uh, that's excellent. Um, and newer work by John Rebecki that is also related to um, to rationality is the idea of wisdom, which says well, an 
a system usually is not just rational from the get-go, but what is more important is the process by which you become more rational over time, uh, which is about the systematic uh, overcoming of delusion, right? When you misconstrue the environment in a certain way, which is exactly what predictive processing again also talks about, but if you misconstrue the environment, you will fail to reach your goals. And usually this misconstrual comes from some form of deception uh, that you have to break through. And uh, mm-hmm. this is, I mean, as, as rationality and reaching your goals is extremely important, the idea of wisdom and, and systematically overcoming self-deception um, to, to have be closer in touch with reality. Um, I, I personally can't imagine anything that is more relevant and important for actual daily life. Uh, it's, uh, I think one should read all of the, the literature or at least the high level uh, things and, and really understand those ideas very deeply. It, it can, overcoming misconstrual can, that's not just that's not just a philosophical thing, right? Uh, it it is often we we think about the world in a way that makes us completely fail in it. So um, having this understanding of how we can overcome that uh, definitely is extremely powerful for everyday life, for decision making processes, and so forth. So, yes, <laughs> giving a very long answer here. So this actually also connects in a way to uh, self knowledge, right? Yes. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I talked about it as well in my, my video with John Reiki. Um, Yes, of course, right? Because you yourself are a very, very crucial part of your life and your decision making. And then knowing how you behave sy- systematically helps you to factor in certain parts of yourself. And you don't, just because you are yourself doesn't mean you know yourself just by, mm-hmm. well, being yourself every day, but you have to have active insight in how you are. Right. If you know you are a person that becomes very hangry, it's very important to pack a bit of food before you go somewhere, because otherwise you might very embarrassingly lash out to people. So you can account for how you are and those things you you learn by well repeatedly being yourself and then paying attention to how you seem to be to to act in, in certain environments and situations and then to take that into account and and uh yeah uh, to to then again reach your goals because you like you are one of the most important constraints and you are uh, similar to humans in many, many ways, but you are also unique in in some ways uh, and and you have to understand those parts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have perhaps one or two more questions just to recap a little bit what we've been talking about here and wrap up our conversation. So um, looking at the current stage of the rationality debate, I mean, do you think there's a still space? I mean, okay, so let me reframe the question. So looking at the diff- the several different uh, ideas and schools of thought that we talked about here, like, for example, we mentioned homo economic is the axiomatic definition of rationality. We mentioned things like bounded rationality, ecological rationality, and then relevance realization. Uh, how do you look at how they might interrelate to one another? And do you think that even though now we have this more, let's call it nuanced idea about how human rationality works and it's not just about those optimal sort of outcomes, do you think there's still some space now for uh, things like uh, the axiomatic definition of rationality and some of the ideas coming from the homo economic uh, economic is sort of paradigm yes <laughs> yes uh, i think there, there's space for all of those things and how true they are is like a pragmatic question that re- is always related to well the context you're in and the goals you want to reach so when you look at again at economics they they of course still have the they do still do optimality modeling that is based mm-hmm. on an axiomatic uh, uh, view and to my current understanding, it is very important that we still do this, uh, but we also have to understand the limitations of this framework. Um, but whenever you model anything, you have to make assumptions um, yeah. because you just right when you when you try to model everything, then it becomes that is just the real world, and you can't like it's just completely intractable to do that. Um, and then wrapping up, how do how how does the rest relate? And um, so. There is there's many things going on from my perspective. Everything that's happening in active inference is, or the free energy principle is an extension of of the rationality idea of the idea of optimality that just takes into account the, the living being. Um, so 
from my perspective, it is related to the rationality question. Um, then when you look at the current ongoing research in, in uh, AI, uh, you have reinforcement learning, which is the, right, how does an, an organism or an agent over time interact with an environment and decide what to do, uh, given the information it gets. Uh, like the, the, given the reward, this is of course one formalization of the same question. Um, then you currently have a lot of uh, in-stream of, uh, I would say, finally the 4E framework into into the the whole framework. Uh, in, sorry, into the whole ideas of, of rationality, um, like em embedded, uh, embedded, embodied, uh, enacted rationality. There, there's lots of publications from the last year. Um, so. Yeah, even, I think there's so much space to write the continued developments in AI, which are related to the question, the, the research by, by Friston and all his many colleagues, so much going on. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, space to, uh, or like people that apply it in in uh, in, in uh, policy decision making. So, for example, David Tuckett um, uh, and and colleagues have the, the Cruise Network that, that very actively uh, comes out to speak against the, the um, the optimal optimal choice uh, framework idea uh, because it's under the radical uncertainty we, we, this is not the most meaningful way to construe the question so for me I, I think people would maybe disagree and just like say oh no this is where where things are happening but for me this is all very related uh, and connected so there's a lot of space for individual advancements of the of the uh, endeavors but also interdisciplinary communication and then also um yeah taking the ideas and applying them of course so that's basically how we how you look at the future of the debate about this more sort of interdisciplinary way of tackling it without excluding any sort of possible approach paradigm or school of thought about rationality out there, right? Yes, um, exactly. I, I think individual fields. Uh, the individual approaches will come to further conclusion. It's an ongoing dialogue. Uh, if, if I could already predict how it will how it will end, then I wouldn't need to participate in it. But um, there's like fantastic people making fantastic points uh, that will completely change your mind. And uh, the world is exactly computational irreducible. So I'm just like very excited to see what's going to happen and uh, to read a lot of amazing work and see how how people integrate all the all the new insights great so let's end on that note then uh, just before we go would you like just briefly to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet mm -hmm. um so i have a website it's called uh, riedelanna.com uh, and there's also a sub page where you can find the cognitive science map and otherwise you can find me on any social media platform but i think twitter is probably most relevant or not x uh, as anna lepticon a n n a L E P T I K O N, Analepticon. Great. So I'm leaving links and the handles to all of that in the description of the interview. And Anna, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been really fun to talk to you. Thank you very much. That was very fun. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. And also please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perurgo Larson, Jerry Muller, Ernst Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Olaf, Alex, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Ruinasio, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Phil Kavana, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andre, Francis Forti, Agnun, Svergor Kossen, Hal Herzog, Nun, Machado, Jonathan Labyrinth, John Nyars, Tantanti, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, John Weyre, Tom Hamel, Sardis, France, David Sloan, Wilson, Yasila, Desaraujo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Puntara, Dana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavlos Tazewski, Nelek Bakka, Madison, Gary G. Alman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, George Stephanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles de Moray, Alex Shaw, Maury Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilley Jr., Old Erringbone, 
Asteri, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N, Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dovner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandon, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Ecoriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crowley, Kate Van Goller, Alexander Hubbard, uh, Liam Dunaway, B.R. Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hertner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings, David Pinsoff, Sean Nelson, Mike Lavigne, and Dios Necht. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Ignick, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Alni Cortez and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadrian, Bogdan Canivets and Rosie. Thank you for all.